Okay, we are on chapter three in A Long Way from Chicago. And something I didn't mention about these chapters, each chapter is a new year, a new summer that the kids spend with grandma. So the first chapter was Shotgun Cheatham was 1929. The second chapter, which we just read, The Mouse and the Milk was 1930. The third chapter, A One Woman Crime Wave, is 1931. So this is the third summer that the kids are spending with their grandmother. And so let's see what adventures they have this summer. A one woman crime wave. A great depression had swept over the nation and we couldn't seem to throw it off. It was still hovering over us as people said. It hadn't burned out, bottomed out yet, but it was headed that way. You could see hard times from the window of the Washburn Bluebird. The freight trains on the siding were loaded down with men trying to get from one part of the country to another, looking for work and something to eat. Mary Alice and I watched them as they stood in the open doors of the freight cars. They were were walking along the right of way too, with nothing in their hands. Then when we got off the train at Grandma's, a new sign on the platform read, Drifters keep moving, this means you. It was signed by the sheriff. But at Grandma's house, it seemed to be business as usual. Mary Alice was still skittish about the old snaggletooth tomcat in the cob house. Grandma said if he worried her that much, she ought to use the chamber pot in place of the privy. Chamber pots were under all of the beds, and they are handy at night. But Mary Alice wouldn't use hers during the day. She didn't want to climb the stairs just for that. And then she didn't want to have to empty it any more than necessary. Being nine, Mary Alice decided to take charge. She carried a broom to the privy to swap the cat, if he gave her any trouble. She was soon back that first afternoon, dragging the broom. Her eyes were watering, and she was holding her nose. Something died in the cob house, she said. Nah, Grandma said, it's the cheese. I don't want any, Mary Alice said. It's not for you, Grandma said. Now that she mentioned it, I could still smell something pretty powerful wafting into the kitchen. And I could see the old tomcat from here stretched out in the yard. He was breathing hard and nowhere near the cob house. The cheese smelled bad enough to gas a cat, (laughs) but it was no use asking what it was for. We were bound to find out later. Grandma's house was the last one in town. Next to it, a row of glads was a, next to the row of glads was a wire, woven wire fence. And on the other side of it was a cornfield. On the first night, I'd always lie in bed, listening to the husky whisper of the dry August corn in the fields. Then on the second night, I wouldn't hear anything. But this year came the sound of shuffling boots and sometimes a voice. The washburn tracks that cut the town in two ran on the other side of the road. The sheriff's deputies were out carrying shotguns, moving the drifters along so they didn't hang around town to beg for food. From my window, I watched the swaying lanterns, and ahead of them, the slumping figures of the drifters heading for the next town. It was kind of spooky and sad, but it was a short night. At five the next morning, Grandma was at the foot of the stairs, banging a spoon against a pan. When we all got down to the kitchen, we found her in a pair of man's overalls stuffed into gumboots. She couldn't go outdoors in overalls, so she'd pulled a wash dress over them and her apron over that, crowning it. All of it was her gardening hat. She anchored it with a veil to keep the mosquitoes away and tied it under her chin. She looked like a moving mountain. Mary Alice couldn't believe the overalls. Keeps off the chiggers, Grandma explained. We're going fishing. I looked around for the rods and reels, at least some bamboo poles, but I didn't see anything. It's just one thing after another in this town, Grandma declared. We wasn't over decoration day before it was the 4th of July. Then comes the old settler's picnic, and you can hardly go down the street for the crowds, and the dust never settles. I need me a day off and some peace and quiet. Fresh from Chicago Loop, Mary Alice and I traded glances. We didn't linger over breakfast because of the smell. The cheese was on the back porch now in a gunny sack. It began to dawn on me that it was the kind of cheese catfish consider a delicacy. Grandma was ready to go, and when she was ready, you better be. Let's get on the road, she said, taking a last look around the kitchen. Douse the fire and hide hide the axe in the skillet. We blinked. Just a saying, Grandma said, a country saying. I was a country girl, you know, 
She carried a gunny sack of cheese herself, tied to the end of the tree limb, hitched up on her shoulder. I was in charge of the picnic basket, and it took all I had to lift it. I looked inside. Half of the hamper was home cooked home canned fruit, tomatoes, and pickled peaches, and the other half was vegetables from her garden. Snap beans, turnips, cabbage. The only thing that looked like a picnic was a loaf of unsliced home-baked bread. But I didn't ask Grandma. But I didn't ask. Grandma saved herself a lot of bother but not by not being the kind of person that you question. We trooped out into the morning behind her, and as soon as we left her yard, we were in the country but I had the feeling that it would be a long trip. The hamper weighed a ton, and I had no luck in getting Mary Alice to carry the other handle. We were well covered against chiggers, and the day was already too hot. Mary Alice preferred skirts, but she had on her play suit with her long pants. Being 11, I was way too old for shorts anyway, so I had on my jeans. We marched behind Grandma, and it wasn't too bad until the sun came up over the castles, the tassels of the corn. We ate the dust of the road for a mile or so, and of course, being a city boy, I didn't know what a mile was, but it felt like a mile. At the stand of trim timber, we veered across the pasture. Watch your step, Grandma said. Cow pies a plenty. We were making for Salt Creek, and pretty soon the trees along the creek began to show over the horizon, but they were like a mirage that was keeping its distance. Finally, we came to a barbed wire fence with the sign on it. No trespassing whatsoever, no fishing, nothing. Private property of Plate County Rod and Gun Club. Signed by the sheriff. Lift that wire so I can skin under, Grandma said. The lowest wire was pretty close to the ground, but Grandma was already flat on her back in the weeds. She pushed the cheese through, and now she began to work her shoulders to inch herself under. I pulled up on the wire to the best of my ability, but there wasn't much slack to it. The barb snagged her hair, though she cleared her nose. By now, she, but now here came her bosom. Mary Alice stood by, sucking in her own small chest, hoping to help. The wire cut my hand, and I was stabbed three times by the barbs. But like a miracle, Grandma shimmied under. Mary Alice followed with plenty of room, though she didn't like to get burrs in her hair. Being a boy, I climbed over the wires and pivoted on the fence post, on the heel of a wounded hand. I dragged the hamper through, and now we were in the forbidden territory. It looked overgrown and deserted to me, but Grandma, speaking low, said, Hush up from here on and just keep behind me. We were in trees and tall grass, and as we slooped to the creek bottom, the ground grew soggier underfoot. Dragonflies skated over the scum of the stagnant backwater. Grandma made her way along the willows, weeping into the water. When she pulled back a tangle of vines, we saw an old, worn-out, snub-nosed rowboat. It was pulled up and tied to the tree, and the oars were shipped shipped in the wet bottom, I guess that means stored, beside a long pole with a steel hook at the end. Work that rope loose, Grandma whispered to me. She pointed for Mary Alice to climb aboard and she followed, reaching back to me for the hamper. The knot was easy, but pushing the boat out with Grandma in it wasn't. By the time the boat was afloat, I was up to my shoe tops in muddy water. I never thought a minute that this was Grandma's boat, but she was an expert rower. She had the oars in the locks, and they pulled the water with hardly a ripple. She rode up, turned us, and rode along the bank under the low-hanging limbs. We were on our way somewhere, quiet as the morning. I was in the back of the boat, lolling, my mind drifting, and then I got the scare of my life. A low limb writhered and looped, and I caught a glimpse of sliding scales and an evil eye, maybe even a fang, and then an enormous snake dropped into the boat. It just missed Grandma's lap and fell hissing between her and me. The last thing I saw from this thing, thick as tires, was snapping into a coil. When I came to, we were tied up to a sapling, and Grandma was crouched over me. She was applying a rag wet with creek water to my forehead. Mary Alice was behind her, looking round-eyed at me. You fainted, Joey, she accused. Boys don't faint. I passed out, and it was probably mostly from the heat. Sunstroke, maybe. And then I remembered the snake and I grabbed up my knees. Never mind, Grandma said, it's gone. It was harmless. Good size, but harmless. There's cotton mouse around here, though, so I'd keep my hands in the boat if I was you. It was swell, Mary Alice said. It was keen. You should have seen how Grandma grabbed it by its neck and snapped it. Just once and broke its neck. 
It was all neck, if you ask me. And then she hauled off and flung it way out into the water. Mary Alice went on relentlessly. Grandma, something worse with snakes. You should have seen. Okay, okay, I muttered. Grandma stifled a rare smile. I suspected she had no opinion of the bravery of the male sex, and I hadn't done anything to change her mind. Why wasn't it Mary Alice who'd done the fainting? It bothered me off and on for years. We were underway again, me keeping a sharp eye on low hanging limbs. I was recovering from everything but embarrassment and grandma was rowing out from the bank and now she was putting up the oars and standing in the boat. It rocked dangerously, though she planted her big boots as wide as the sides allowed. She reached down for the long rod with the hook at the end. Glancing briefly into the brown water, she plunged the rod into the creek and it hit something and she began to pull the rod back up hand over hand. She was weaving to keep her balance in the tipping boat. I wanted to hang on to the sides, but I pictured a cottonmouth rearing up and sinking its fangs into my hand. I thought of cottonmouths and I ducked, but they were catfish, mad as hornets who had been drawn by grandma's terrible cheese. She heaved in the crate and unlatched the top. In the bottom of the boat was a wire and net contraption that expanded as she filled it with a wriggling fish. A catfish is the ugliest thing with its gills, and even Mary Alice drew back her feet. Grandma kept at it, bent over in the boat. She was as busy as a bird dog, one of her old favorite sayings. When all of the catfish were in the net, flopping their last to the bottom of the boat, she took the new cheese out of the gunny sack and stuck it in the crate. Grandma, how did you remember where it was, I said, amazed. You couldn't see it, but you snagged it with the hook right off. Remembered where I sunk it, she said briefly. And now she was lowering the empty crate, baited with cheese, back into the water. Except it wasn't a crate. It was a fish trap. And when we went into Wisconsin to fish, using a fish trap carried a $5 fine. Grandma, I said, is trapping fish legal in this state? If it was, she said, we wouldn't have to be so quiet. What's the fine? Nothing if you don't get caught, she said. Anyhow, it's not my boat which was an example of the way Grandma reasoned. Them critters love that cheese, she said fondly of the trap, as the trap sank from her view. She bent over the side to try and watch the smell, wash the smell off her hands, nearly swamping the boat. Soon we were gliding gently downstream, Grandma moving easily. The catfish were at her feet, flopping less now. My brain buzzed. Dad was a dedicated fisherman. He tried his own flies. He was a member of the conservation club. What if he knew his own mother ran an illegal fish traps? Brewing home beer was one thing because the prohibition law only profited the bootleggers. But we're talking about good sportsmanship here. I noticed Mary Alice's eyes on me. She was watching me around grandma's growing arm and she was reading my not mind. It was then that we both decided never to tell dad. You could say one thing for Grandma's method. She got all your fishing done at once. It wasn't later than 8 o'clock, maybe, we'd gotten away with it. It seemed to me that we ought to have brought some poles along and a can of worms, considering our catch. But I thought maybe things would settle down now and we could have the quiet day in the country Grandma wanted. And then we heard the singing. I almost jumped into the boat. It felt as if there were three. we three were alone in the world, and now the singing warbled up from around a bend in the creek like a bad barbershop quartet with extra voices chiming in. Camp Town Lady, sing this song, do-da, do-da. Grandma nudged the boat onto the bank just where the creek began to bend. Through the undergrowth, we saw a ramshackle building on the far bank. Above the porch was a sign, a plank with words burned in, Rod and Gun Club. A row of empty whiskey bottles stood on the porch rail, and from behind them came the singing. Bet my money on the bobtail nag, somebody bet on the bay. The porch sagged with singers, grown men in their underwear, still partying from last night, old guys in real droopy underwear. It wasn't a, it was a grisly sight, and Mary Alice's eyes bugged. It wasn't sure she ought to be seeing this. They were waving bottles and trying to dance. I didn't know what they'd do next, and Grandma was fascinated. As she watched, a skinny old guy with a deputy's badge pinned in his long john stepped forward and real sick over the rails into the water. Earl T. Askew, Grandma muttered, president of the Chamber of Commerce. 
But now a fat old geezer in the droopiest drawers and nothing else pulled himself up on the porch rail. Bottles toppled into the water as he stood barefoot on the rail, teetering back and forth while the others behind him roared, Woo, woo, shut up a minute, he roared back at them, and I'll sing you a good song. And he slung, he took a slug out of a bottle in his fist and he began to sing. Then he fell back into the arms of the cheering crowd. Ain't that disgusting, Grandma said. He couldn't carry a tune in a bucket. Who is he? I whispered. Obi Dickerson, the sheriff, she said. And them drunk skunks with him, the entire business community of the town. Mary Alice gasped. The drawers on some of the business communities were riding mighty low. They're not acting right, she said very prim. Men in bunch never do, Grandma said. They were tight enough to fight. They were tight enough to fight, too, and we were on their private property. Not only that, we were in a boat full of trap fish, almost under the bloodshot eye of the sheriff. I thought it was time to head upstream as fast as Grandma could row, but nope. She jammed an oar into the bank and pushed us off, and then she began rowing around the bend, and my heart stopped. The full chorus was singing again louder and louder as we got nearer. The Rod and Gun Club came into view, and so did we. Mary Alice was perched in the boat. Grandma was rowing steadily, and I was in the stern wondering if the fish showed. It took the drunks on the porch a moment to focus on us. We were sailing right past them now, smooth as silk and big as life. They saw us, and Grandma saw them, as if for the first time. She seemed to lose control of the oars, and her mouth fell open in shock. Mary Alice was already shocked and didn't have to pretend. I didn't know where to look. Some of the business communities were so far gone, they just stared back, unbelieving. They thought that they owned this stretch of the creek. A few, seeing that Grandma and Mary Alice were of the opposite sex, scrambled to hide themselves behind the others. But you never saw anybody looking as scandalized as Grandma was at those old birds in their union suits and less. She was speechless as her gaze passed over them all, recognizing every one of them. It was a silent scene until Sheriff O.B. Dickerson found his voice. Stop in the name of the law, he bellowed. That's my boat. Before the rod and gun club was out of sight, Grandma had regained control of the oars. She rode on as if none of this had ever happened. The sun was beating down, so she didn't push herself. After all, the sheriff couldn't chase us downstream. We were in his boat. Around another bend and a flock of turtles sunning on stumps, Grandma pulled up for the remains of the old dock. We tied up there, and now we were out of the boat, climbing a bluff. Grandma led, dragging the net of catfish. I was in the rear, doing my best with the picnic basket. Mary Alice was between us, watching where she walked, and there was a, she was scared of snakes, then she led on, if you ask me. An old house without a speck of paint on it stood tall on the bluff. Its outbuildings had caved in, and the privy stood at an angle. There was still prairie chicken prairie chickens around in those days, and they were pecking the dirt. Otherwise, the place looked lifeless. Rags hung at the windows. The porch overlooking the creek had fallen off. Grandma tramped around to the far side of the house, and she dropped her fish on the ground and waved us inside. Even in full daylight, the place looked haunted. I didn't want to go in, but Mary Alice was marching through the door already, so I had to. Is anybody inside? I whispered to Grandma as I lugged the hamper past her. Nobody but Aunt Puss Chapman, she said, like anybody would know that. It had been a fine house once. A wide black walnut staircase rose to the landing window with most of its stained glass still in it. But it was creepy in here, dim and dusty, and it smelled funny too. We went into the room, piled with furniture. The one with the chair, then one of the chairs spoke. Where you been, girl? Mary Alice flinched, but the old woman lost in the chair was staring straight at Grandma and calling her girl. She was many years the oldest person we had ever seen up until then. Bald as an egg, but she needed a shave and not a tooth in her head. Who them children with you? She demanded of Grandma. Just kids I found along the creek bank, Grandma said to our surprise. They was fishing. I don't know as I want them in my house. Aunt Puss Chapman stared at us with a mean look. Do they steal? Nothing you got, Grandma said under her breath. Talk up, girl, Aunt Puss said. You mumble. I've spoken to you about that before. She pulled her shawl closer as though, even though it was the hottest day of the year. I'm hungry. You hightailed out of here after breakfast, and I ain't seen hide nor hoof of you since. She ain't seen me for a week, Grandma mumbled to us, but she forgets. <laughs>
And then she called out to Aunt Puss, catfish and fried potatoes and onions, vinegar slaw and a pickled peach a piece, and more of the same for your supper. I suppose it bears starving, Aunt Puss snapped. But hop to it, girl. Stir your stumps. I thought I might faint again. Nobody could talk to Grandma like that and live. She led us back to an old-time kitchen. It was in bad shape, but well-stocked. Big sacks of potatoes and onions, cornmeal, things in cans. We'd brought a full hamper to Aunt to Aunt, Puss, Aunt Puss's larder. I had to fire up the stove with a bunch of kindling while Grandma and Mary Alice went to work on the potatoes and onions. Mary Alice was in as big a daze as I was. Grandma, is that nasty old lady your aunt? I stopped to listen. If she was, that made her our great-great-aunt. Nah, I was hired girl to her before I was married, Grandma said. Lived in this house and fetched and carried for her and slept in the attic. You had a room in the attic? Nah, I just slept there. Had a bed tick with straw in it and changed it every spring. I had always lived in the luxury you see me in now. What did she pay you, Grandma? Pay? She didn't pay me a nickel, but she fed me. I thought about that. And now you feed her, I said, but Grandma didn't reply. We cleaned the fish on a plank table outdoors. I didn't care much for it. It made me kind of sick to hear Grandma rip the skin off the catfish. She had her own quick way of doing that, but every time it sounded like the fish screamed. She put me in charge of chopping off their heads, but I didn't like chopping off the head of anything looking back at me. And catfish have mustaches for some reason, which is just plain weird. Finally, Mary Alice took the nasty hatchet out of my hand and whoop, she'd bring down the blade and that fish head would go flying. Mary Alice was good at it, so I let her do it. Grandma gutted. It was afternoon before we sat down at the dining room table in a cob, cobwebby gas, under a cobwebby gasoler. It's like a chandelier, but it's with, the, whoops, but it's not electric. The lights work with gas. I think I lost my page. Yes, there we go. Aunt Puss was already at her place, and so she was sprier than she looked. Grandma settled at the foot of the table. Without her hat, her white hair hung in damp tendrils. We'd been working like a whole pack of hungry dogs, of bird dogs. Watching Aunt Puss gum cat fit was not a pretty sight. These fish taste muddy, she observed. You didn't catch them? Yes, I said. No, Mary Alice said. What'd you use for the bait? Aunt Puss said, looking at both of us. Cheese, I said. Worms, Mary Alice said more wisely. Since we couldn't get together on our story, Aunt Puss changed the subject. The children still in school? We nodded. Do they whoop you? Do they what? Mary Alice said. Do they paddle you behind when you need it? Aunt Puss looked interested. If they did, I'd quit school, said Mary Alice, who'd just completed third grade. They whooped that girl raw, Aunt Puss pointed her foot fork down the table at Grandma. I had a sudden thought. Aunt Puss thought Grandma and Mary Alice and I were all the same age. She hadn't noticed the years passing. That's why Grandma didn't say we were her grandchildren. It would have mixed up Aunt Puss. And that's when she came to work for me. They'd throwed her out of that school. Aunt Puss peered down the table. Tell them why. We looked at Grandma, naturally interested to know why she'd been thrown, throwed, thrown out of school. Grandma waved us away. I forget, she said. I don't. Aunt Puss waved a fork. It's because you wadded up your underwear to stop the flu on the stove and smoke out the schoolhouse. And that was the end of your education. Working for you was an education, Grandma muttered, though only Mary Alice and I heard. It took us another hour to clean up the kitchen the way Grandma wanted to leave it. When it was time for us to go, Aunt Puss was back in her chair in the parlor. Where do you think you're off to now? She called out as she trooped down the front hall. Down to the sty to slop the hogs, Grandma called back. Well, don't dawdle. You dawdle, I've spoken to you about that before. Get on out of here, Aunt Puss hollered. Let door hit you where the hot dog bit you. Outdoors, I said. Dogs have hogs. Does she have hogs? She used to, Grandma said. She was right well off at one time. She's poor now, but she don't know it. How could she? She still had her hired girl and plenty to eat. You take her food every week, don't you, Grandma? Generally a good roast chicken. She can gum that for days. Grandma turned down the lane. It keeps her out of the poor farm, and it gives me a quiet day in the country, and that's a fair swap. Then her jaw clenched in its way, but it's just private business between me and her, and I don't tell my private business. She walked country roads all the way home. Grandma set a brisk pace whoop, to take off my sweater. 
and I struggled along behind her with the hamper, heavy with cleaned catfish. Mary Alice went in the middle, watching where she walked. By the time we got home, the trees in Grandma's yards were throwing long shadows, and it was evening in her kitchen. Mary Alice and I were both staggering. I was ready to go straight to bed, but Grandma said, Skin on down to the cellar and bring up 15 or 20 bottles of my beer. Just carry two at a time. I don't want any broke, I whimpered. But she was turning on Mary Alice, and you and me's gonna fry up a couple pecks of potato to go with these fish. There won't be nothing to it. I peeled the potatoes this morning before you two was up. We stared. The catfish fried in long pans with the potatoes and the onions at the other end popping in the grease. The kitchen was blue with smoke and the night at the windows before we finished up. Now get down every platter I own, she said. Then she sent me for the card table. I used it for a jigsaw puzzle of Charles Lindbergh. Following her lead, we carried everything out into the night, making many trips. We lugged it all across the road and set up the Waterbush Railroad right of way and planted the card table in the gravel. Finally, the platters of fish and potatoes overlapped on the table and the open beer bottle stood in a row beside the tracks. As the drifters came along, being hounded out of town, Grandma gave them each good feed and a beer to wet their whistles. Mary Alice helped in an apron of grandma's that dragged to the ground. There were hollow-eyed men who couldn't believe their luck. Two or three of them, then five or six, then a bunch standing around the table eating with both hands, sharing, sharing out the beer. They didn't say much, and they didn't thank her. She wasn't looking for thanks. She'd been taken off her overalls and put on the same wash dress back on, but she tied a fresh apron over it. Her hair was a mess, fanning out from the bun at the back, white in the moonlight. She watched them feed, working her mouth. Then we saw the swinging lanterns, the sheriff and his deputies coming up along behind the drifters to keep the drifters moving. Up trooped O.B. Dickerson, dressed now with his badge out and his belt full of bullets riding low under his belly. His deputies loomed behind him, but they weren't singing Sweet Adeline. Okay, okay, break it up, he said, elbowing through the drifters. And then he came to drama. Grandma. Dag nabbit, Mrs. Dowdle, you're everywhere I turn. You're all over me like white on rice. Now, what do you think you're doing? I'm giving these boys the first eats they've had today. Or yesterday, a drifter said. Mrs. Dowdle, let me explain something to you, the sheriff bawled. We don't want to feed these loafers. We want them out of our town. They're out of town, Grandma pointed her spatula at the sheriff's feet. The town stops there. We're in the country. Yes, and I'm the sheriff of the country, O.B. Dickerson Barrow. You're in my jurisdiction. Do tell, Grandma said. Run me in. The minute she said that, all the drifters looked up. There was Sheriff Dickerson, deputies they saw, outnumbered. Mrs. Dowdle, the sheriff boomed. I wouldn't know what to charge you with first. You're a one-woman crime wave. Where'd you get that fish, for instance? He said, wisely overlooking the home brews in the drifters' hands. Out of the trap in Salt Creek, Grandma remarked. Same as you get yours. O.B. Dickerson's eyes bulged. You're accusing me, the sheriff of Pratt County, of running fish traps? He poked his own chest with a pudgy finger. Not this morning, Grandma replied. He was too drunk. The drifters chuckled. And talking about this morning, the sheriff said, his face shading purple even in the darkness. You stole my boat. That's what we call larceny, Mrs. Dowdle. You could go up for that. Oh, well, the boat, Grandma made a little gesture with the spatula. You'll find it tied up at Aunt Puss Chapman's dock. As a rule, I take it back where you tie it. As a rule, I take it back where you tie it up. But of course, I couldn't do that this morning. How could I row these grandchildren of mine back past the rod and gun club? They'd already seen what no child should. The sheriff and his deputies, blind, drunk, and naked as jaybirds, Jansen jigs on the porch. And I don't know what all. <clears throat> I'd like to have marked this girl for life. Grandma nudged Mary Alice, who stood there in big apron, looking drooped and damaged. I'm thinking about taking her to the doctor so she can talk it out. I don't want her to develop one of them complexes you hear about. Whoa, 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 the deputies murmured behind Sheriff Dickerson. Earl T. Askew stepped up and said into his ear, O.B., let's just let sleeping dog glide. I got my hands full with Mrs. Askew as it is. The sheriff simmered, but he said, Okay, Earl, if you say so. The sheriff and his posse were in retreat now, but he had to cover himself. Mrs. Dowdle, he said, pulling a long face, these things I can overlook, but it seems to me you're running a soup kitchen without a license from the Board of Health, and I have an idea there's a law against that on the books. Go look it up, O.B., Grandma said. See if there's a law against feeding the hungry. But I have to tell you, you've talked so long, the evidence is all ate up. And of course it was. The drifters had wolfed down the last morsel. With a small figure, Mary Alice pointed out the bare platters. 
Only a faint scent of fried catfish lingered in the night air. The empty beer bottles went without saying. The drifters were moving down the track, and the deputies were heading back into town. Obie Dickerson spit in the gravel, swung around and followed them, his big boots grinding gravel. We stacked the platters and rounded up the beer bottles for Grandma's beer next batch. I collected the legs on the card. I collapsed the legs on the card table. There wasn't a lot of music in Grandma, but she was humming as we worked, and I thought I recognized the tune. But after our quiet day in the country, we carried everything back down the road under the silver dollar moon, and that is the end of the year 1931.